Today we're celebrating the Feast of the Ascension. It was this past Thursday, 40 days after Easter. And it's an incredibly important day of remembrance, not only in the life of the church, but in our lives as Christians. In some sense, though, it's kind of the forgotten feast day because many churches don't make a big deal about it. They don't hold special services. But it's important that we talk about its significance for us because it is very significant. You know, the church celebrates all the major events of Jesus' life. At Christmas, we celebrate the incarnation when God took human flesh and came and dwelt among us. And then at Palm Sunday, we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus on the, the week of Pente uh, Pentecost, yes, Passover, Passover, sorry. And then Monday Thursday is when we recognize the Last Supper. Good Friday is when we remember the cross of Christ. And most people think that the celebration of the resurrection at Easter is kind of the climactic moment in this series of events. But that's stopping just short. The next big deal isn't Pentecost. The next big deal really is the Ascension. Because until Jesus returns, the Ascension is the climactic moment in the life of our Lord and in the life of the church. Because without it, our faith would look very different. There would be some important things missing had Jesus not ascended to the Father. In fact, if there were no Ascension, there would be no Pentecost. Now you might wonder what I'm talking about, and we'll get there. We're going to talk about all of the important <laughs> significance of the Ascension this morning so that we can understand what this historic event meant and still means to us today. Primarily, the Ascension marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry and the beginning of his heavenly ministry. And when he rose from the dead, he spent 40 days appearing to different people. We know that he appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. <coughs> he appeared to the disciples in the upper room at least twice. Uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He had breakfast on the beach with them. And um, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one point Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. And I think the reason for this length of time and this number of appearances of his was to assure the disciples that Jesus really was in fact alive. They weren't just hallucinating. They weren't just suffering from wishful thinking. That his body bore those fatal marks, and yet it was still intact. He could still breathe and talk and move around and eat. But yet at the same time, it was somehow changed. It was the same Jesus, but different. He seemed somehow to be less bound by time and space in this new resurrected state, because we know that he could appear and disappear. We know that locked doors were no challenge for him. He just went right through them. Before they could get too comfortable with this new reality of this resurrected Jesus, he left them. Luke said in our reading from Acts that he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. How appropriate that it would be a cloud involved in the ascension because all throughout scripture, clouds are a symbol of God's presence and his glory. When God led the Israelites through the wilderness after he delivered them from Egypt, he led them by a pillar of cloud by day, right? And when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, a cloud enveloped the mountain to show us God's presence there with Moses. And then when Moses had them build the tabernacle and they were ready to bless it and consecrate it, a cloud of glory descended on it and God's presence filled it. Same thing happened again with the temple later when they consecrated the temple again. A cloud came upon it to show God's glory and presence. Even at the transfiguration, when Jesus is standing there with Moses and Elijah, they got en enveloped in a cloud as well. So it's a, it's a strong symbol of God's glory and presence with us. And it's also important to note that he was taken up before their very eyes. I mean, he could have just kind of disappeared, slipped away secretly, but then they would have spent all their time looking for him instead of getting about what he had sent them to do. They had work to do. They didn't have time to go looking for him. In fact, the angel said, what are you doing looking up there? You got stuff to do, get busy. So the ascension was also yet another proof that God really had come to us in human form. That everything he said about himself was true. He told the disciples repeatedly that he had come down from heaven. And now they were starting to get the idea. 
our gospel reading today, Jesus was praying that his, to, for his disciples, and he said, Father, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. And as he was fully God and fully man, when he ascended into heaven, he took his human form with him. He didn't shed his body like a cocoon and float away like a butterfly. His risen and glorified human body ascended with him. Now think about that for a minute. That's kind of mind-blowing. At the incarnation, deity entered into the human race in the form of the God-man Jesus. And at the ascension, humanity entered into God's very presence in the same God-man, Jesus Christ. So he really did open the way for us to follow. We really do belong in heaven because our humanity is already there in Jesus. And Jesus had to return to the Father for a number of reasons. One of which is, the earth, this earth has fallen. It's full of sin and corruption. It's really not an appropriate place for the Son of God. Yet, He came all the same. He came and dwelt among us to rescue us from this sin and destruction. Because He considered us worth saving. We're the cause of all the sin, destruction, and rebellion. And yet, He considered us worth saving. And he came to be among us so that he could reclaim our lives for the Father. But he didn't just rescue us from the judgment that we were due. He came so that we could be with him and could bring us home one day. He told his disciples in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you and I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You see, as redeemed saints, this so sinful and fallen world really isn't a suitable place for us anymore either. In the world, but we're not of the world. So one of the significances of the ascension is that it reminds us that heaven is our true home. And that should affect how we live day to day because we have an inheritance. Peter said in his first official epistle, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. This inheritance reminds us that we are to live our lives on earth from an eternal perspective, holding the things of earth loosely, knowing that we, we can't keep them. We won't take them with us. And also reminding us that this life is filled with both blessing and pain, both joy and sorrow, but there is coming a time when all of that will pass, and there will only be unspeakable joy beyond what we could even imagine. All, one day all of the evil and suffering will come to an end. Another major significance of the ascension is that it completes God's work on the cross through Christ, through His atonement. You know, Jesus died as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, but if you remember how the sacrifices work, the, the sacrifice was killed and then the blood was taken by the priest into the Holy of Holies and presented to God. And that's what Jesus did when he ascended. He ascended as our great high priest and brought his own blood before God to complete the work of atonement there. And then he sat down at God's right hand, the place of ultimate authority where he continues that priestly work on our behalf because he's interceding for us, he's praying for us. He is our advocate before the Father. Just as on earth he revealed the Father to us, now in heaven he reveals us to the Father. So that when the Lord looks down upon us, the redeemed, those who are in Christ, he no longer sees us as our sinful, in our sinful states, he sees us as Christ, because we are clothed in him, and we are washed by his blood. Hebrews 7 says he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. So we can have confidence when we come to God in prayer, that he'll hear our prayers because we're not coming in our own strength and by our own merit, we're coming in Christ. All of our sin has been dealt with, and so we can enter into God's presence and have that faith and confidence that he will receive us. And in this exalted place, he's been given all authority. And he has given 
his disciples that authority in his name. That's what he said in the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This authority is empowered and directed in our lives by the Holy Spirit. And it was given to the disciples ten days after the ascension on the day of Pentecost. And although the Holy Spirit's been active and present since the beginning of the world, at the, His coming at the Pentecost was something very different, something very new. Now remember I said that without ascension you couldn't have Pentecost? That's because Jesus said in John 16, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's the necessary chain of events. Jesus ascends and then the Holy Spirit descends in new power and strength. And it allows Jesus to keep that promise. He said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us always through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus was on earth, there was one aspect of his deity he could not express. He was fully God, but he couldn't express his omnipresence. He couldn't be everywhere all the time. He was limited by his human body. He could only be one place at a time. But now that he's ascended and the Holy Spirit has come, through the Holy Spirit, he can be with each and every one of us no matter where we are, no matter what's going on. He is, he is able to be there with us. Each believer receives the Holy Spirit when we come to God in faith and we receive gifts, spiritual gifts that enable us to support the work of the ministry in the church, to build each other up. And we use those to carry on Christ's work so that we can be his hands and feet in the world. That's what the church is, the body of Christ. Mm. Right before he ascended to the Father, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he told them, that's not for you to know, the timing. You don't get to know when I'm going to return. But he did promise to send the Holy Spirit. And it was his way of letting them know that the kingdom of God was going to look differently than what they expected. It was going to be different from human kingdoms. John Stott said the kingdom of God is his rule set up in the lives of his people by the Holy Spirit. It is spread by witnesses, not by soldiers, through a gospel of peace, not a declaration of war, and by the work of the Spirit, not by force of arms, political intrigue, or revolutionary violence very different type of kingdom. They would receive that Holy Spirit power and then use it to be his witnesses in the world, beginning right where they were in Jerusalem. But not just there. They were to go beyond that and venture out into the surrounding regions, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now imagine if they'd stayed in Jerusalem. Imagine if they had not obeyed God's command to go. Christianity would not have spread. It would have been this little localized religion that probably would have died out over time. But praise God, they did. They did go. It was important that they do that, and it's just as important today that we go with the good news of the gospel. We share it with those that are closest to us, but also those that we need. And we support those who go to regions where the gospel is not easily received, or places where it's, where it's opposed and where it's hostile for that. Because we remember that God so loved the world. And so the whole world needs to know about his saving power. The last significance of the ascension I want to talk about is Jesus said that that shows us how he will return one day. He left in cloud, and he's going to return in the clouds. The angel said, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. <coughs> on a cloud of glory, Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. The dead. The dead will be raised, and those who are redeemed by Christ's blood will go with him to be in heaven. And then he will punish the wicked and put an end to Satan and all of the evil, finally, for all. And then he'll establish a new creation, a new kingdom, a new heaven, and a new earth. Revelation 1-7 says, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Only a handful of people saw him ascend. No one's going to miss it when he returns. The ascension is a very significant event for our lives and in the life of the church. 
And it's also very significant for understanding about the Holy Spirit. So it's important that we learn about it. It's, it's part of our doctrine. It's part of our teaching. But it's also part of our lives. Let's pray. Oh God, you have glorified our victorious Savior with a triumphant resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, where he sits at your right hand. Grant, we ask you that his triumphs and glories may ever shine in our eyes to make us see more clearly through his sufferings and more courageously endure our own, being assured by his example that as we endeavor to live and die like him for the cause of your love in ourselves and others, you will raise our dead bodies again and conforming them to his glorious body, call us above the clouds and give us possession of your everlasting kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.